97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DeCecco. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. You know, we, we recognize the, the ability of the roster that's, that's put together right now. And I think we have the ability to do something really special uh, with this group, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. It's powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now. They'll match your first deposit up to $250. At PlaySugarHouse.com, you can win real money with the sports book, along with casino games from the comfort of your home. Must be 21 or older to play gambling problem. 1-800-GAMBLER. Andrew DeCecco is in. Jim Schwartz spoke today. Had a lot of interesting things to say as we get ready to move forward to Pittsburgh. Eagles on the road. There's going to be some fans in the stands. About 5,500 fans will be allowed at Heights Field, home of the Steelers. Let's get into it now with Andrew DeCecco here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. And, Andrew, welcome back, man. And, of course, uh, the Eagles now moving forward here. A lot of defensive stuff with Jim Schwartz talking today. I want to start with um, the linebacker's position because Schwartz was asked about Geary today. All right, now you do a show and know Seth Joyner pretty well, correct? Yes. All right. Joyner played linebacker, so I'm going to take him as a guy who who knows the position pretty well. Now – Schwartz is asked today about people who don't watch the tape or just uh, that are outside the building being critical, not really knowing what they're talking about, that there are times when it's not his fault. He just happens to be the closest guy. Now, Joyner says the guy stinks, okay? I'm going to take Joyner's word. Is Schwartz just covering for Geary, or is he accurate? Is Geary not a problem as you see it? Well, that's certainly something that Seth and I have discussed on on end for since probably prior to the draft, and that's just something that the Eagles have not addressed. There's no there's no sugarcoating it. The Eagles have the worst linebacking core in the NFL, and Nathan Gary is a big part of the problem there. And a lot of what I've kind of seen in my film study is his eyes often get him into trouble. He's often often caught looking into the backfield. He's a step too slow in coverage. He doesn't close on the ball particularly fast. When he has a beat on the running backs, he doesn't take the proper angles. Oftentimes he struggles to disengage from linemen when he does have an opportunity to, you know, when he is, when he is in position to make a tackle. There's just a lot of things there that you can't really gloss over when you're looking at some of his deficiencies. Yes, a lot of the, not all the errors that, that, are, that come into his zone are, are necessarily, you know, credited to Nathan. Most of them are. You know, and and that's and that's problematic. And but I also would like to say that it's not all Nathan Gary. There, as much grief as he gets, T.J. Edwards has been has had a hand in some errors, and and so has Duke Riley. And and those are really all the guys that they have to work with right now. And and they've all had their share of blemishes throughout the season. Well, I was going to go in that direction. You brought up these other names. I sit here, and while I do think that Nathan Gary is a problem. What's the alternative? What are you supposed to do? And Alex Singleton gets a ball thrown right into his chest and brings it back to the house, and now we're all thinking, huh, is he the better option? I mean, I ask you, is there really a better option? Do you live and die with Nate Gary because he's at least experienced and been here, or do you need to look in another direction? Well, as good as Alex Singleton played, I think a lot of fans get enamored with the new kid on the block, so to speak, or as far as someone who gets in there makes a couple plays and like they kind of like a backup quarterback. They're the most popular guy until they actually go in there and you see what the, you see them perform. And um, Alex Singleton is a guy who went in there and he played very hungry and the ball was thrown to him. Yes, but he made some nice plays against the run. But as far as the option that you have, they don't have, the Eagles don't have a ton of options behind those guys. You have Sean Bradley, who would logically be the next player to step up. He's a fundamentally sound player, but he's limited athletically. There's not a lot he can do from a coverage standpoint that the Eagles really would need, but he can kind of fill in the TJ Edwards role. Should TJ, should TJ miss any time with that hamstring injury, but Alex Singleton can play some outside linebacker and Davion Taylor still ways away from playing. So their options are very limited and, you know, no offense to Alex Singleton when fans were viewing Alex Singleton as, as the savior to the linebacking core. I mean, that kind of speaks to the problem right there. Sure it does. Um, and, and moving forward here, um, if Edwards is out, is Singleton even the next guy up? I mean, do they go and play Geary and Singleton on Sunday against the Steelers? 
Um, I think that it would probably be something along the lines of, he would, yes, Alex would, would would sprinkle in a little bit, but I think it would be more so Nathan and um, Sean Bradley, who I think is more comparable to a TJ Edwards as far as playing the run and being an instinctual player that can attack downhill and do some of the things that TJ can. I, I think you get the uh, – as, as, as daunting as those options are, I think that you kind of get the – in the Eagles' eyes, at least, you get the best of both worlds and a player who seemingly could should be their, their coverage guy and Nathan Gary, who was a former safety of Nebraska – and um, and someone like Sean Bradley, who's who's a very heady player that could, that that is afraid to mix it up between the tackles. So, um, well, yeah, that 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 to me would be the best combination. Either way, you uh, by the way, Geary is six two two twenty nine, and uh, Singleton is six two two forty. So Singleton a bit bigger. But what I thought was interesting about Singleton was what's the stat he ran the f- the fifth fastest time out of any player of the week on that interception return he ran faster than Jalen Rigger did on the 55 yard like so apparently he's got some athletic ability and can move for a bigger guy yeah he can you kind of got to see that when he shot off the gap made some plays against the run moves pretty well laterally and you see him on special teams every week where he's just flying down the field. He's oftentimes the first guy down the field in punt coverage and on you know, kickoff coverage. And he runs through the end zone because obviously the returns haven't had a great deal of opportunities to run the football back. But you kind of get to see his explosiveness. And um, that's, that's, that is kind of impressive to see from a 240-pound athlete. Yeah. But um, I think that they're definitely going to find ways to get him on the field. And obviously the options are extremely limited right now. So he really has to be. But I don't necessarily know if he can be – a guy that can sit there and take on the full slate of snaps that uh, T.J. Edwards did. I think yeah. he'd be more of a third linebacker in that regard. Yeah, and even like um, you, you mentioned that he shot the gap. I thought he did a good – he played 15 snaps, I think it was, and ended up with two tackles, a pass broken up, and an interception. So he was pretty productive. You're right. You're, you're, everybody likes the new guy on the block, but the new guy got put into a, a spot and actually for a position that's much maligned. Uh, performed. That's a position that's going to be interesting to look at this week. James Conner, obviously a, a back that has some uh, you know downhill ability, pretty big guy. I want to ask you about what do you do with Mills? Um, I don't know what you thought about him at safety. I don't know how you thought he played on Sunday night, but do you just say, you know what, the safety thing wasn't working, let's scrap that and go back to put him there? Was Is he better than Maddox is at that spot? What's your take on Mills' moving forward well it doesn't get talked about nearly enough because Jalen Mills has become somewhat of a scapegoat a lot of times um in Philadelphia and, and a lot of times rightfully slow so but on Sunday night I thought Jalen played a relatively fun a sound game he was fundamentally sound and he made a lot of tough tackles on the edge there I think he gives the Eagles a lot more than what Avante Maddox can give him at this point Avante Maddox to me will be their nickel corner next season He's kind of thrown in there by default because it didn't work out with Sidney Jones or Rasul Douglas for you know one reason or another, and then that's kind of what they have there. I think it's too quick to give up on Jalen Mills as a safety, you know, three games I guess because the fourth game he played corner. I think it's too early to scrap that, but right now he gives the Eagles their best chance in that second corner, and you, you could see some platooning going on, can continue to go on with uh, Kayvon Wallace and Marcus Epps at safety. And I think that that's really their like, their their cornerback depth. They they need a guy like Jalen Mills. But as far as safety, they do have a, a, a few more options to go to. If Will Parks was available, I think I would like it even more because I think he can solidify that spot, and then Jalen Mills could play corner, and I would like that. You mentioned Wallace. He limited action, and I just think you know there were moments when it was, "Hey, welcome to the NFL." What were your mm-hmm. thoughts on Wallace as a whole? Yeah, I, I think that he got a well, he got kind of it was a baptism by fire going against George Kittle. That'll you know that that's a it's a heck of a start for for any rookie. But I mean that's a tough task for any rookie. But uh, I thought he I thought he did okay. He he found he was around the football a little bit. He didn't do a whole. I mean he didn't make a whole lot of plays, but he also didn't make a whole lot of mistakes. Uh, Marcus Epps is someone who I think is a more physical player. I think he attacks downhill a little bit more. Yes, he got posterized on that IU play. But there are certain things that he does from an from a football intellect standpoint, and, and just a just a just an athletic standpoint and a physicality standpoint that really resonates with the coaching staff for one reason or another. We're not privy to that because we're not in the meeting rooms. But he is well thought of in the Novacare complex, so he's going to continue to get his opportunities. Football at four. Andrew DeCheco, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Uh, Eagles defensive coordinator uh, Jim Schwartz spoke today. 
And uh, he, he had uh, some, you know, interesting things to say moving forward here. And one of them had to do with, um, you know, uh, the defensive backs. He said he made a point last week. They're playing a lot of man-to-man. Have you seen Schwartz, you know, change some of his principles up this year? Have Has he made adjustments? Uh, you know, that's something he has been criticized for. Like, hey, you know what Jim Schwartz is going to do? This is what he does. Has Schwartz made adjustments? Yeah, I think he has, and you're seeing that with the, and I think the X factor there without, you know, is a no brainer is Darius Slay. He gives them, a, he gives Jim a lot of flexibility in what he's able to do on the back end. And a lot of the positionless players that they have, even though they're depleted there right now, that gives them a lot more flexibility in what they're able to do in terms of coverage. And I think you're seeing a new approach in Jim Schwartz because he finally has, you know, a vast array of players to work with that have different skill sets. And, uh, you know, four games into the season, I think he's kind of navigating through and, and, and figuring out what works best. But that's been the best approach going through uh, going through the early slate of games here. Jim Schwartz is interesting to me because, you know, I, I support him. I know he has flaws. I'm not saying he doesn't have flaws. But, like, last game, for example, I thought he had a tremendous game. And then what ended up happening was he played the prevent defense and it got super close and then fans – automatically assume that he needs to be fired. Four games in, the Eagles' defense is number one in sacks, number nine in yards allowed, number five in yards per play allowed, and number five on third down. So I just kind of want to get your overall thoughts throughout his entire, you know, coaching through the first four games. It's it's so easy to get frustrated with how close mm-hmm. it got. It shouldn't have got that close, I get it. But overall, what he did with Avery, with what he's doing with this defensive line to get this type of pressure, he's doing a lot of great things that, from a coaching standpoint as well. Yeah, I agree with you there. Jim Schwartz is another guy that's gotten ridiculed over, over his tenure in Philadelphia. And again, a lot of times it's been rightfully so. But he is a good coach. He's done a lot of, he's had to do a lot of smoke and mirrors with limited personnel at his disposal. But you mentioned Gennard Avery and players like that that he's kind of worked with. And Jayla Mills is kind of – he's had some nice moments with Jim, under Jim Schwartz. And, and there's certain players that, have, that, that he's able to kind of work around their skill sets. But the one thing I will say about Jim is his scheme is not very imaginative. Teams don't really have to prepare much for him. It's very – if you're not getting home with, your, with, the, with the front four – I mean, they're not, they're typically not going to get home on those plays and the secondaries kind of left, uh, left hang, they're hanging out to dry out there. So uh, I think he's not an aggressive defensive coordinator granted, but you're starting to see some changes in his philosophy because of the pieces that he has. And uh, that all starts with Darius play. But I, I mean, I think I, I've seen a little bit of growth out of Jim Schwartz and he is a good coach, despite what the, uh, the outside perception may be at times. I agree with you. And, and with the limited players, how much say does he specifically have in some of these players on the roster? Like, he looks at his defensive side of the ball. He's someone who's respected in this league. Is he the one that wants to have, like, I can't believe I'm saying this, but, like, he wants to have a Nate Gary? He wants to have some of these players on the roster? Is he someone who chooses some of these players on the defense that we may look at and go, what is going on here? I think that's fair. I, I don't necessarily know how much say he has uh, as a whole, as far as players that, that he's, that he has to work with. I know he's a big Jalen Mills fan and I know he's, he's very high on Marcus Epps and certain players like that. But, you know, in large part, I think that he's given these guys and, you know, he's kind of got to make it work. He's, he's got to make chicken salad and so to speak. And, um, and I think that, you know, given the, given the personnel and, and the pieces that he's been given, He's done, a, he's done a fairly admirable job. Obviously, that Ben but don't break the defense is, is eventually going to break if you continue to, if you continue to you know, kind of put, put band-aids on certain positions, such as linebacker and safety. But, yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily know that if, if he had it his way, he wouldn't want a guy like, he would want a guy like, like Nathan Gary there fronting his linebacking core. Uh, I would imagine that there's not one defensive coach in the league that wants Nate Gary. He's been here for a long time, right? Like, you look at Schwartz. Fronting, fronting. You talk about the personnel, though. It's like, you know, he would have some say in the personnel decisions on that backside of the football. So, all right, so you think Jim Schwartz says, give me a guy like Gary? No, I don't think it goes to that (laughs) degree, but I do think that he has said, he's been here for a long time. It's not like he's been here for one season. He's consistently in this linebacker core. Unbelievable. Yeah, Uh, yeah, he is, yeah. Yeah, he is, And, and, and I imagine when they drafted him, I don't know. You guys can maybe disagree with me. I don't think they visioned him as the leader of the linebacking unit. Do you? No, absolutely not. I think he was more viewed as, okay, he's a, he's a converted safety. Let's see what we can get out of this guy. He'll be a core special teamer, probably a third linebacker. They, he was lauded for his coverage acumen. 
Let's see if we can kind of get him in there and match him up against tight ends. But as far as someone that's going to play 99% of the defensive snaps, no, I don't, I don't think they ever envision that. And that's what they got. Speaking of snaps, Jannard Avery got very few, but he was very productive. Um, is that a role for him going forward, that situational type of guy? Um, but, I mean, they, they had a very good pass rush. And, and, and I'll follow up with this after you talk about Avery, which we, we touched on him a little bit yesterday. But Schwartz, you know, insinuated this week that playing him in that role is the best. Is that the best role for him? Yes, and you look at someone like Jannard Avery, who's six foot, two hundred and fifty pounds. Guys like that aren't meant to be one of the someone that you want to throw out there for forty snaps a game. He's going to be his optimal usage is going to be twelve to eighteen snaps. Keep him fresh, have him come off the edge with a with a full head of steam, and you know just have that burst and energy that that that, that, that he's known for that quick twist, quick twitch burst off the edge. Otherwise, if you keep putting him out there, you tend he, he's a player of his mold is going to wear down, and they're not going to have the same effect as effectiveness as they would in the fourth quarter of games, which is really where you need someone like that as a fastball off the edge. I thought that he kind of mentioned something today about him having such a large repertoire of pass rush, uh, pass rush moves in his arsenal, and the Eagles and the Eagles defensive coaches and Matt Burke and 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 Washburn have really kind of honed in on what works best for him. And he's taken well to that, and you kind of see it all come together, you know, games into his tenure, about 10 or 13, 10, 10 to 11 games into his Eagles tenure. All right, so with that being said, the pass rush, um, the overall pass rush the last couple of weeks, very good, very consistent. And, and that's, that's the name of the game for this defense, right? So you have um, Sweat, Avery as the kind of the backup guys. Then you have Graham and Barnett, who I thought played his best game. You had Jackson. You know, that group there. How much do you think that the uh, really the success of the team, offense and defense, is tied to that defensive front? Oh, it 100% is because if you, when you look at the state of what the secondary is right now, what they can get from their defensive line means everything. It's in, it's integral to the success of the entire defense. And, you know, you, let's, you mentioned those guys, but you also are going to be getting Vinny Curry back. Casey Tuhill is a player that, could, that has a lot of ability. We haven't even mentioned him. He was only active for the Rams game, but he also has that in that Gennard Avery type of mold that can be, you know, give you that 12 to, 12 to 16 or 18 snaps a game if he had to. And he's going to come off the edge with, with, a, with tenacity and he uses his hand extremely well. Those are, they have a lot of guys there that they can use, and which is going to be very important when you face these tougher teams coming on the schedule here. And, um, and that, that's the identity of their defense, and they need to get pressure from, from, their, from their defensive line. And if they don't, you tend to see that those are the games that tend to spiral out of control fairly early. But well, we were talking about Jalen Mills. You mentioned Avante Maddox and, and Roby Coleman, and I was thinking about Cravon LeBlanc, who made an impact play. And I just think about, you know, if you do move Avante Maddox back to the slot area, now there's like a three-way battle involved with that position for the most part. And what is the best role for Cravon LeBlanc? Because he does make plays, but is he like a, a singleton where he makes the play because it's like a spark plug kind of thing, more so than if he had mm-hmm. full-time play, it would be different. What's the best role for someone like LeBlanc? You know, I'm going to give you a basketball analogy. Craven LeBlanc, to me, reminds me of a T.J. McConnell Love it. Knew player. you were going there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As far as someone that, yeah, he's not the fastest guy. He's not the biggest guy. But when he, when he is in, he's productive. But he's also not someone you want to put in there and have him start an entire game because then you tend to get some of his skill sets kind of gets exposed. His limitations, I should say, get exposed as far as what you saw. Even, you even saw that down the field with George Kittle. Craven just couldn't keep up with him, and not, not many corners can, but, you know, we're talking about a tight end running down the field. There are certain things that Craven does extremely well. He's aggressive to the football. He closes on the football well. He's a smart player, but, again, not someone that you want out there for an entire game, not someone that you want to build your defense around or your secondary plans around. I don't know where he would fit in next season. I think you, you put Maddox in the slot and let, and let the rest of it sort itself out whether he's a backup again or whether he goes, he goes somewhere else. Remember he was released um, and didn't sign. And, and there was no teams that, that, you know, kind of snatched him up before the Eagles, you know, kind of re-signed him. I don't know how he's viewed around the league. I know he was, he was waived a couple of times and, 
he's he, he's a good role player for what he is. Uh, he's a good, but I mean, as far as someone that you're going to throw in there and and give him, you know, the bulk of the of the slot snaps or 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 role or pivotal role like that, I don't necessarily think that that's what their their plans are for him. What do you make of Andrew uh, Russell Douglas having success? Uh, Sullivan having success. Uh, who's the other guy? Bosby made a play. I saw the other night that he's, uh, you know, doing some things with Denver. What do you make of some sure. of these guys who have struggled here, uh, going other places and kind of uh, finding their way? Well, as far as Rasul Douglas is concerned, it's amazing what a player can do when they're put into a system that best fits their skill set. And that's what I'll say about him. He's He's in a scheme right now. That he's that he's built to thrive in, and you know we're starting to see that happen before our very eyes. You saw what he did against DeAndre Hopkins; very impressive. Um, and, a, and a player like Chandon Sullivan, to me, epitomizes what a big problem as far as evaluation has been uh, from the Eagles' standpoint. When you have a young player who's forced into action because of injuries or whatever the situation is, they struggle, you know, and they inevitably struggle because they're kind of thrown into the fire. And they get, and they give up on them, and they never go back to those guys, and they kind of fall out of favor, and they're, they're eventually placed on waivers, and they go somewhere else. Shannon Sullivan's a player that was a Senior Bowl player; he was a Sun Belt star. He ha- he always had ability. They just didn't give him the they weren't they didn't put him in the best position to be successful. And the Green Bay Packers afforded him an opportunity. They were more patient with him, and they actually invested in him. And you're seeing what he can do with, you know, with proper coaching. And I think that has been, it's not just Chandon. There, there's a lot of players you can look to that have kind of fallen victim to similar circumstances in Philadelphia. And I think that has to do with a lot of, uh, from a de- poor developmental standpoint. Uh, he's Andrew DeCecco and uh, it's football at four powered by the inside the birds podcast. And of course, uh, every day, four o'clock, we do football at four Mosher tomorrow, Kaplan on Thursday, Mosher on Friday, Andrew, of course, um, the uh, Eagles, uh, you get the Tuesday where Jim Schwartz talks. I want to say, if they're going to make the playoffs, to me, see if you agree, it's because that defense took them there. Yeah, there's just too many moving parts on offense right now to get any kind of sustained success on there. You don't know what you're going – if Deshaun Jackson's going to come back and be the player that he always was his whole career or if he's going to be a shell, continue to be a shell of his former self. There's just so much uncertainty there. The offensive line's in shambles. How long is that going to be able to, you know, be sustained? Like, there's just too many question marks there. I think on defense, the hallmark there is, is, is pressure-based. Their defensive line is where all their investments have been. And if, if they're going to have any kind of success this season, it's going to be, you know, on, on their shoulders. Uh, real quick, would you pick up Sanu? Sanu, he's kind of bounced around a little bit. You have to wonder what he has left and and really where he would fit. To me, he's a slot receiver and not much more than that at this point in his career. And the Eagles already have a number of guys that are, you know, slot based. You look at Deontay Burnett and Greg Ward and we can go on and on and on, but um, let the young guys play. Let's see what they got. I agree. Uh, I, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, I, I agree with you. He's very similar to the guys you have. Just, you know, I, I don't know that. And I, I don't know, um, Jeffrey, if, if do you anticipate Jeffrey back this week? Um, I think I think there's an outside chance that either him or Quez Watkins return in the lineup this week. That kind of, when I saw Green Killens get waived, obviously he, the Eagles only need five running backs on the active roster, but to me, that kind of sparks something that there might be another offensive weapon that, that's going to be available this weekend. And I would have to think that that would be Alshon or Quez Watkins. I still think that Deshaun Jackson's a ways away with that hamstring injury. Uh, by the way, I know you're a big Van Halen guy. What's your favorite Van Halen? Eddie Van Halen passed away, for those of you who uh, are just tuning in. Uh, what's your favorite? You got, uh, you got Van Halen on shuffle the rest of the day. Uh, what's, your yeah, go- what's your go-to Van Halen? The Cradle Will Rock. Cradle will rock. Let me see if I can uh, pull that up for you on the uh, the old get out of here right now. As uh, you know, uh, I, as we saw saw that news and was like, whoa! I know you're a big guitar guy, right? Well, yeah, I'm a huge guitar guy. I mean, you could go with that. You can go with Eruption. That's that's this, that's Eddie's signature song right there. So yeah, you, yeah, go with Eruption if you can find it. All right, we'll try to uh, pull that up real fast so we can. Hey, uh, obviously, good stuff as always on the football at four here. 
And uh, he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as uh, Andrew Checo Every day, 4 o'clock, the Inside the Birds podcast guys bring you football at 4. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, guys.